From Plasse to Partition Chapter 6 The Age of Gandhian Politics Part 3 Khilafat and Non-Cooperation Movements After the withdrawal of the Rolat Satyagraha, Gandhi got involved in the Khilafat movement, in which he saw a splendid opportunity to unite the Hindus and the Muslims in a common struggle against the British. In the early 20th century, there emerged a new Muslim leadership, which moved away from the loyalist politics of Sir Syed Ahmad Khan and the elitism of the older Aligarh generation and looked for the support of the entire community behind them. For these younger leaders there was no basic contradiction between Muslim self-affirmation and Indian nationalism. Certain new issues also emerged around this time, which shook their faith in British patronage. The Muslim University campaign, renewed again after 1910, suffered a setback when the government took a hard line about insisting on strict government control and vetoed the idea of making it an affiliating body. The partition of Bengal was annulled in 1911 and the Muslim League in its Calcutta session in 1912 regretted it. In 1911-12 the Tripolitan and the Balkan Wars appeared as a European conspiracy to weaken the Ottoman Empire, which was the last of the Muslim powers in the world. A Turkish relief fund was raised and a Red Crescent medical mission was sent to Turkey in March 1912. A number of Muslim newspapers and periodicals, such as Comrade, Hamdard, Zameen Dar and Al-Hilal appeared both in English and in Urdu, reflecting these concerns of the educated Indian Muslims. Along with the new educated middle-class leadership, the ulma or the Muslim clergy were also emerging as a new political force, or more significantly, as an important link between the different Muslim groups in India. Two institutions, i.e., the Darululam at Deoband and the Firangi Mahal at Lucknow, were instrumental in their rise. The Deobandis formed in 1910 the Jamiat al Ansar or an old students' association, and in 1913 a Quranic school in Delhi, to reach the wider Muslim community at a time when they were deeply affected, both emotionally and politically by the Balkan Wars. In Lucknow, the Ulma at the Firangi Mahal, who in the 18th century represented a rationalist school of Islamic learning, had been taking increasing interest in world Islam since the 1870s. One of them, Abdul Bari, along with the Ali brothers Muhammad and Shaukat now opened an All India Anjumni Khuddami Kaaba to unite all Indians to protect Muslim holy places. The younger Muslim leaders thus closed the distance, which Syed Ahmed would prefer to maintain with the ulma, as they were more eager to forge a community of believers or ummah, as opposed to Sir Syed's qom or a community of common descent. In the meanwhile, the anti-Congress and pro-government attitude of the Muslim League was also changing with the induction of younger men, like Muhammad Ali, Wazir Hassan or Abul Kalam Azad, into its leadership. Muhammad Ali Jinnah was brought in and he became a bridge between the League and the Congress. These tendencies became more prominent when Britain declared war against Turkey in November 1914. The Muslims refused to believe that it was a non-religious war, as leaders like Ali brothers with pro-Turkish sympathies were soon put behind bars. The Lucknow Pact in 1916 offered a joint League Congress scheme for constitutional reforms, demanding representative government and dominion status for India. The principle of separate electorate was accepted, and proportional representation in both imperial and provincial legislature was agreed upon. In 1917 the Muslim League supported the home rule agitation started by Annie Besant. But the outbreak of communal riots in Bihar, United Provinces and Bengal soon after this rapprochement revealed the continuing disjunction between the masses and the leaders. The latter's lingering faith in constitutional politics suffered a further jolt when the Montauchans' Ford reforms in 1919 totally disregarded the Lucknow Pact and the Muslim University Bill passed in September 1920 provided for a non-affiliating university under strict government control. The defeat of Turkey created the spectre of Islam in danger, an issue that could be used to mobilize mass support. 
The result of these developments was a shift in Muslim League leadership from the moderate constitutionalists to those who believed in Islamic religious self-assertion and broad-based mass movement. The Delhi session of the Muslim League in December 1918 invited the ulma and gave them public prominence, thus for the first time bringing them directly into the political centre stage. The context was thus prepared for the beginning of Khilafat movement, the first mass agitation to forge political unity among a divided Indian Muslim community. Behind the Khilafat movement were the rumours about a harsh peace treaty being imposed on the Ottoman Emperor, who was still regarded as the Khalifa or the spiritual head of the Islamic world. The movement, launched by a Khilafat committee formed in Bombay in March 1919, had three main demands, the Khalifa must retain control over the Muslim holy places, he must be left with his pre-war territories so that he could maintain his position as the head of the Islamic world and the Jaziratul Arab, Arabia, Syria, Iraq and Palestine, must not be under non-Muslim sovereignty. It was thus a pan-Islamic movement in all its appearance, as the cause had nothing to do with India. But as Gail Minolt has shown, the Khilafat was being used more as a symbol, while the leaders actually had little concern about altering the political realities in the Middle East. It was found to be a symbol that could unite the Indian Muslim community divided along many fault lines, such as regional, linguistic, class and sectarian. To use Minol's words, a pan-Islamic symbol opened the way to pan-Indian Islamic political mobilization. It was anti-British, which inspired Gandhi to support this cause in a bid to bring the Muslims into the mainstream of Indian nationalism. Initially the Khilafat movement had to broad trends, a moderate trend headed by the Bombay merchants and a radical trend led by the younger Muslim leaders like Muhammad Ali, Shaukat Ali, Maulana Azad and the Ulma. The former group preferred to proceed through the familiar constitutional path of sending a delegation to the Viceroy or ensuring Muslim representation in the Paris Peace Conference. The latter group, on the other hand, wanted a mass agitation against the British on the basis of unity with the Hindus. Gandhi took up the Khilafat cause and initially played a mediating role between the moderates and the radicals. The moderates began to lose ground when the delegation headed by Dr. Ansari and participated by Muhammad Ali himself, met the Viceroy, then Prime Minister Lloyd George and then visited Paris, but returned empty-handed. The radicals then took charge of the movement as emotions ran high after the publication of the terms of the Treaty of Sevres with Turkey in May 1920. In the same month, the Hunter Commission Majority Report was published, and it did not seem strong enough in condemning General Dyer's role in the Jaliam Wallabag massacre. This infuriated Indian public opinion. The Allahabad Conference of the Central Khilafat Committee, held on 1-June 1920, decided to launch a four-stage non-cooperation movement, boycott of titles, civil services, police and army and finally non-payment of taxes. The whole movement was to begin with the Hartal on 1st August. Muslim opinion on non-cooperation was still divided and throughout the summer of 1920 Gandhi and Shaukat Ali toured extensively mobilizing popular support for the program. The Hartal was a grand success, as it coincided with the death of Tilak, and from then on support for non-cooperation began to rise. Gandhi now pressed the Congress to adopt a similar plan of campaign on three issues, Punjab wrong, Khilafat wrong and Swaraj. In an article in Young India he announced that through this movement he would bring Swaraj in one year. He did not, however, define what this Swaraj would actually mean. The established politicians of the Congress still had their doubts about a non-cooperation program. As they had no experience in mass agitation, it appeared to be a leap in the dark. There was an apprehension that it might lead to violence which would delay the implementation of the new constitutional reform, since the elections to the reformed councils were scheduled for November 1920. On the other hand, Support for Gandhi's proposal for a non-cooperation movement came from the politically backward provinces and groups, which were not hitherto involved in Congress politics. Between September and December 1920 the Congress witnessed a tussle between these two groups, 
as neither side wanted a split and searched for a consensus. A special session of the Congress was convened at Calcutta on 4-9 September 1920, where Gandhi's resolution on non-cooperation program was approved over a qualifying amendment from Bipin Chandra Pal of Bengal, and despite stiff opposition from the old guards, like Siya Das, Jinnah or Pal. The program provided for surrender of government titles, boycott of schools, courts and councils, boycott of foreign goods, encouragement of national schools, arbitration courts and khadi, homespun cloth. The program was then endorsed at the regular session of the Congress at Nagpur in December 1920. Year two opposition came from Das, who sought to turn the table against Gandhi by proposing a more radical program. But ultimately a compromise was reached as Das turned over to Gandhi's side. The resolution accepted all parts of the non-cooperation program, but it was to be implemented in stages as directed by the All India Congress Committee. The movement, Gandhi assured, would bring Swaraj within one year. If that did not happen or if government resorted to repression, then a civil disobedience campaign was to be launched involving non-payment of taxes. The resolution also provided for a radical restructuring of the Congress through the constitution of district and village-level units to transform the party into a true mass organization. Why the veteran Congress leaders accepted Gandhi and his proposal of a mass movement is a matter of conjecture and controversy. Judith Brown thinks that the Nagpur resolution was a victory for Gandhi as he made no concessions of principle while Richard Gordon and Rajat Ray think that it was Gandhi who capitulated to Das and accepted many of his proposals. Putting aside these extreme views, we may perhaps argue that in a context of changing balance of power within the Congress, both needed each other. Gandhi's potential as a political organizer had been established and he had access to new areas of political support, which were beyond the reach of the older Congress leaders. Gandhi's support was coming from the Muslim Khilafatists, from the backward regions and backward classes. A populist groundswell, sometimes fueled by millenarian hopes, and often outside the ambit of the Congress, had been visible in different parts of India. Independent peasant movements had appeared in the Midnapur district of Bengal, in parts of North Bihar, in the Avad district of Uttar Pradesh and in the Kedah district of Gujarat. This was also the period of labor unrest and trade unionism, marked by a major strike in the Bombay textile industry in January 1919, appearance of the Madras Labor Union in April 1918, some 125 new trade unions and finally the formation of the All India Trade Union Congress in Bombay in November 1920. Within this context, there was an unusually large attendance, 14,582 at the Nagpur session of the Congress and most of these new delegates were the supporters of Gandhi. The established leaders were swayed by this huge mass support and accepted the Gandhian creed, although with much hesitation, and not without resistance. On the other hand, Gandhi too needed the Congress leaders, without whom he could not hope to organize a nationwide movement, as his recent experience of Rolat Satyagra had clearly demonstrated. His goal was to forge a grand coalition of various classes and communities and in this sense the Nagpur Congress symbolized the emergence of a centrist leadership within the pluralist structure of political India. The non-cooperation movement began in January 1921, the initial emphasis being on middle-class participation, such as students leaving schools and colleges and lawyers giving up their legal practice. Simultaneously, there were efforts at developing national schools and arbitration courts, raising a Tilak Swaraj fund of 10 million rupees and recruiting an equal number of volunteers. Gradually, the movement became more militant, with the beginning of Bokot, an organization of public bonfires of foreign cloth. A nationwide strike was observed on 17 November, the day the Prince of Wales arrived in India on an official visit. On that day Bombay witnessed the outbreak of the first violent riot of the movement, targeting the Europeans, Anglo-Indians and the Parsis in the city. Gandhi was incensed 
full-scale civil disobedience or a no-tax campaign was postponed. It was decided that an experimental no-revenue campaign would be launched at Bardoli in Gujarat in February 1922. The venue was carefully chosen, as it was a Ryotwari area, with no Zameen Das and therefore no danger of a no-revenue campaign snowballing into a no-rent campaign tearing apart the fragile coalition of classes. But this never happened, as before that the non-cooperation movement was withdrawn. The extent of success of the non-cooperation movement would not definitely give Gandhi total satisfaction. Middle-class participation was not spectacular, as revealed in the figures for school, colleges and court boycotts, while peasant and working-class participation was more impressive. Except in Madras, council election boycott was more or less successful, with the polling average being 5-8%. to Economic boycott was more intense and successful, as the value of imports of foreign cloth dropped from 1,020 million rupees in 1920 to 1921 to 570 million rupees in 1921 to 1922. The import of British cotton piece goods also declined from 1,292 million to 955 million yards during the same period. Partly responsible for this success was trader participation, as the businessmen pledged not to indent foreign cloth for specific periods. During the period 1918 to 1922, while the large industrialists remained anti non cooperation and pro government, the Marwadi and Gujarati merchants, aggrieved by the falling exchange rates and the taxation policy of the government, remained fairly consistently pro nationalist. However, their refusal to import foreign cloth might have also been due to a sudden fall in rupee sterling exchange rates that made import extremely unprofitable. Production of handloom, on the other hand, also increased, but no definite statistics are available for that. Together with non cooperation, there were other associated Gandhian social movements, which also achieved some success. Temperance or anti-liquor campaign resulted in significant drop in liquor excise revenue in Punjab, Madras, Bihar and Orissa. Hindu-Muslim alliance remained unshaken throughout the period, except in the Malabar region. The anti-untouchability campaign, however, remained a secondary concern for the congressmen, though for the first time Gandhi had brought this issue to the forefront of nationalist politics by inserting in the historic 1920 resolution an appeal to rid Hinduism of the reproach of untouchability. The emphasis of the movement was always on the unifying issues and on trying to cut across or reconcile class and communal disjunctions. The most significant aspects of the non-cooperation movement were, however, its uneven geographical spread and wide regional variations. First of all, it was marked by the involvement of regions and classes that did not participate in the past in any movement initiated by the Congress. There was significant peasant participation in Rajasthan, Sindh, Gujarat, Awadh, Assam and Maharashtra, although in some cases such peasant movements were autonomous of any Congress organizational intervention. Of the four linguistic regions in South India, three were effectively brought into the movement, while Karnataka remained unaffected. There was some non-Brahman lower caste participation in Madras and Maharashtra, powerful tribal movements in Andhra Delta and Bengal in the form of forest satyagraha, labor unrest in Madras, Bengal and Assam, traders' participation in Bombay and Bengal. But on the other hand, the masses often crossed the limits of Gandhian creed of non-violence. Gandhi himself condemned the unruly mob but failed to restrain them. And this was the main reason why he hesitated to begin a full-fledged civil disobedience or a no-revenue campaign. The final threshold was reached in the Chauri Chora incident in Gorakhpur district of Uttar Pradesh on 4 February 1922 when villagers burned alive 22 policemen in the local police station. Here the local volunteers had gathered to protest against police oppression and the sale and high prices of certain articles. The police initially sought to deter them by firing in the air. This was interpreted by the crowd as a sign of fear, as bullets were turning into water by the grace of Gandhiji. 
The crowd then marched towards the market, threw brick bats at the police, and when the latter opened real fire, they were chased into the thana, which was then set on fire. For the Gandhian volunteers, the destruction of the thana only signaled the coming of the Gandhi Raj. But for Gandhi, it confirmed the absence of an environment of non violence as the stench of the Bombay riot greeting the Prince of Wales in September 1921 was still fresh in his nostrils, as he described it. The non-cooperation movement was, therefore, withdrawn on 11 February 1922, followed by the Bardoli Resolution, which emphasised the need for constructive work before beginning any political agitation. Gandhi was criticised by his own congressmen, particularly the younger elements, for withdrawing the movement when it had reached its peak. But he stood firm in his faith in non-violence and refused to budge. He was arrested on 10 March 1922 and was sentenced to prison for six years. Officially the Congress-led non-cooperation movement ended, but in different localities it continued despite official withdrawal. Gradually the Khilafat movement too died. It had proved to be another problem for Gandhi, as the attitudes of the Khilafat leaders increasingly revealed that they had accepted the Gandhian creed of non-violence more as a matter of convenience to take advantage of Gandhi's charismatic appeal, rather than as a matter of faith. By bringing in the ulma and by overtly using a religious symbol, the movement evoked religious emotions among the Muslim masses. Violent tendencies soon appeared in the Khilafat movement as the masses lost self-discipline and the leaders failed to control them. The worst-case scenario was the Mopla uprising in Malabar, where the poor Mopla peasants, emboldened by the Khilafat spirit, rose against the Hindu moneylenders and the state. There was also factionalism within the Khilafat committee, as the breach between the ulma, allied with the radical leaders who wanted to move beyond non-violence, and the moderates who preferred to stay with Gandhi, began to widen. There were differences between Gandhi on the one hand and the Ali brothers and Abdul Bari on the other over the issue of escalating use of religious rhetoric. By the end of 1921, with the outbreak of the Mopla uprising in Malabar, followed by other communal riots in various parts of the subcontinent in 1922-1923, there was a visible breach in the Hindu-Muslim alliance. The symbol itself, around which Muslim mass mobilization had taken place, soon lost its significance, as a nationalist revolution in Turkey abolished monarchy or the Khilafat in 1924. In India the Khilafat movement hereafter died down, but the religious emotions which it had articulated continued to persist, matched by an equally militant Hindu radicalism. The non-cooperation Khilafat movement, however, raises many issues about the nature of mass movement in India under the leadership of the Gandhian Congress. In different regions, as we have noted earlier, the movement took different shapes. In all the regions the movement was initially confined to the cities and small towns, where it was primarily dependent on middle-class participation that gradually declined. There was low turnout at the council election almost everywhere, but an exception was Madras, where very few candidates actually withdrew and the Justice Party returned as a majority party in the legislature. In Madras, the movement witnessed from the very beginning a Brahman on Brahman conflict, as the Justice Party launched an active campaign against the Brahman Congress and its non cooperation program and rallied in support of the Montagu Chelms Ford reforms. Because of this resistance, the boycott of foreign cloth was also much weaker in the Tamil regions than in other provinces of India. The development of national schools and arbitration courts and khadi did not succeed everywhere either. In Nagpur division, for example, the inadequacy of national schools forced students to get back to government educational institutions. As arbitration courts became defunct, lawyers got back to their usual legal practice. In most areas, khadi was 30 to 40 percent more expensive than milk cloth, resulting in its unpopularity among the poor people. In many cases, such as in the small towns of Gujarat, mobilization depended on local issues, like temple politics, 
control over municipalities or control over educational institutions or in the south indian towns grievances against rising municipal taxes or the income tax in tamil nadu the success of the temperance movement depended on various social motives such as the sanskritising tendencies of the upwardly mobile castes and local factionalism in some other areas mobilization to an extent depended on personal influence of local leaders such as c r das in bengal whose personal sacrifices giving up a lucrative legal practice for example inspired the younger generation in punjab on the other hand the akali movement has been described by richard fox as representing the largest and longest application of the gandhian program of satyagraha or non-violent resistance however if we look closely at this movement we will find that it had very little direct relevance to his non-cooperation program tracing its origins from the wider reformist singh sabha movement of the late 19th century this particular campaign started in october 1920 when a siromri gurudwara prabandhak committee sgpc was formed its aims were to reform the sikh gurudwaras and to reclaim control of the sikh shrines from the hands of the government manipulated loyalist committees that included non sikhs in december as an auxiliary of the sgpc the akali dal was formed to coordinate jathas to wrest control of the shrines the name akali servants of the eternal god being derived from the small band of martyr warriors formed to defend the faith during the time of ranjit singh already irritated by the administration of martial law and the jallian wallabag massacre the akalis came to a head on collision with the government when in early 1921 it took the keys of the golden temple at amritsar and appointed a new manager when the akalis protested the government once more unleashed a repressive regime and the latter responded with satyagraha Gandhi and the Congress supported the campaign which ultimately forced the government to surrender the keys and administration of the temple to the Akalis but the middle class Sikh leadership had only selectively adopted the non cooperation program and once their limited goal was achieved did not allow their distinctive religious struggle to be completely appropriated by the Congress agitation as urban middle class enthusiasm soon petered out all over India Business interest was also vacillating. While the larger Indian capitalists opposed the non-cooperation program from the very beginning, smaller traders and merchants continued to use their networks to promote Hartal and generously donated money to the Tilak Swaraj Fund. But they too opposed a total boycott of foreign goods. Attempts to involve the working classes also ran into problems. For instance, an experiment to involve the tea garden laborers in Assam ended up in a disaster at Chandpur which was condemned severely by Gandhi. Dependence on the capitalists prevented the leaders from mobilizing the working class as Gandhi continually insisted that the movement should maintain harmonious capital labor relationship. In Nagpur and Barar, the Gandhians achieved some influence over the working classes. but this hardly had any significant impact on the overall momentum of the non-cooperation movement in the region and where labor unrest turned violent as in madras the local leaders quickly washed their hands off forcing the striking workers to submit to the authorities this disheartened the workers so much that when in 1920 to the congress workers wanted again to mobilize them there was hardly any response The flagging interest in the urban area soon shifted the focus of the movement to the countryside. It was here that the movement took widely variable shapes depending on the structures of peasant societies. The non-cooperation movement was most effective where the peasants had already organized themselves. In our district of UP a radical peasant movement was being organized since 1918 to 1919 against the oppressive talukdars. This peasant militancy organized at the grassroots level by local leader Baba Ram Chandra was later harnessed by the UP Kisan Sabha which was launched in February 1918 in Allahabad By June 1919 the Kisan Sabha had 450 branches and the UP Congress tried to tap into this reservoir of peasant militancy by tagging the movement to the non-cooperation campaign in the province In North Bihar too 
the Congress movement became most powerful in those areas which witnessed the previous anti-planter agitation, Swami Viswananda's campaign, and Kisan Sabha activities. In the Midnapur district of Bengal, the Mahisha peasants had been organized in 1919 against the union board taxes by local leader B. N. Sasmal. Later on, this movement too merged into the non cooperation campaign. In certain regions of Orissa, like Kanika, for example, the existing tradition of peasant malice or anti feudal demonstrations continuing since the 19th century was later on incorporated into the non cooperation movement. In the Kedar district of Gujarat, the Patidar peasants had already launched a successful no-revenue campaign in 1918 and they were again preparing for another round of stir. This district, for obvious reasons, therefore, became the strongest bastion of non-cooperation movement. In South India, between December 1921 and February 1922 there was a brief and sporadic no-revenue campaign in the Godavari. Krishna and Guntur districts in the Andhra Delta. Here the village officials, through whom the revenue was collected, resigned and the peasants hoping for a collapse of the government, stopped paying the revenue. But when the government instituted an inquiry into their grievances and threatened to arrest the leaders who would not give up, the agitation subsided within weeks. In both these cases, the momentum of the agitations was slowly mounting for quite some time, at least since 1918 to 1919, and these were then integrated into the non-cooperation movement. In other areas, where there was no prehistory of peasant mobilization, the response of the countryside was rather muted. This shows that it was the internal dynamics of the regions that accounted for the success of the non-cooperation movement, rather than the Congress mobilizing an as yet inert peasantry into an organized nationalist campaign. The non-cooperation movement remained more under the control of the Congress leaders where there were homogeneous and dominant peasant communities holding sway over lower caste agricultural labourers, such as the Mahisha peasant caste in Bengal or the Patidar peasant caste in Gujarat. Here local leaders had greater control through caste organisations and other community and kinship networks. Even here, the peasants showed considerable self-initiative. The Patidal peasants had started a no-revenue campaign even without the formal approval of the Congress. Then the withdrawal of the movement so disheartened them that when their leaders wanted to mobilize them again in 1922, they simply refused to respond. Such self-initiative was more clearly discernible where no such homogeneous peasant groups could be found. In some parts of Orissa, for example, Peasants stopped paying rents and forest taxes against the wishes of their local Congress leaders and continued their stir even after its formal withdrawal by the Congress. Elsewhere, in Avad, for example, where there was more cross caste mobilization, the peasants were more uncontrolled. They interpreted Gandhi in their own varied ways and tried to combine the nationalist movement with their own struggle against Talukdari oppression. Attacks on Talukdari property increased in the winter of 1921-1922 and the Congress found it too difficult to control. Gandhi visited UP and criticised the peasants for turning violent, but with no appreciable results. So the Congress decided to abandon it. Baba Ramchandra was arrested and the movement was severely repressed, but the local Congress did not raise a finger. For the peasants in Gorakhpur, for instance, Gandhi represented a symbol of deliverance from day-to-day -day oppression. There were rumours all around which showed that to the peasants Swaraj meant a millennium, a utopian state where there would be no rent, no revenue, no repayment of loans, no zmindar or talukdar. It was a situation which the peasants in their imagination had always desired. Gandhi had thus appealed to their imagination and fired them into action. On the other hand, in Punjab after the Amritsar victory the Akali campaign moved to the countryside, wresting control of the Gurukabak shrine in Navmibar 1922, long after the non-cooperation movement had been formally withdrawn. By January 1923 they had taken control of about 100 shrines, and then in September, when the government deposed the ruler of the princely state of Nabha for his alleged support to the Akalis, 
the latter launched a militant anti-colonial campaign in Jaito for his restoration. During its rural phase the Akali movement at various places crossed the boundary of non-violent movement and the peasants openly defeat the authority of the Raj. Gandhi withdrew his support at this point as he disapproved of the campaign for the deposed Nabha ruler. The government now came down heavily on the Achilles, but ultimately patched up a compromise for fear of affecting the loyalty of the Sikh soldiers. The Gurudwara Reform Act of 1925 restored the control of the shrines to Sikh management. But as the movement was withdrawn, the rural protesters felt betrayed. Gandhi also appealed to the millennial dreams of the Indian tribal population who got involved increasingly in the wider politics of the nation, although on their own terms. In tribal areas, building on the existing traditions of dissent, local leaders organized movements against various localized grievances. In this sense of course, these movements, apart from a faith in Gandhi, had very little in common with the aims and forms of the Gandhian movements. For example, in the hills of Kumau and Garhwal in UP, continuing the existing tradition of dhandak or customary protest against the sovereign, Badridut Pandey of Almora organized a militant movement against Uttar or forced labor and forest laws. To contain the Banyar Raj of the English, Pandey argued, God had sent a savior in the form of another Banya, Gandhi. Although Richard Tucker, 1983, has argued that this was modern political conflict reaching the hills for the first time, the specific forms that the movement took, i. firing the woods or other acts of incendiarism, showed that it had little connection with the formal structures of the Congress movement. Similarly in the Midnapur district of Bengal, where the Santhal grievances had flared up in 1918 against the forest laws and the Midnapur's Mindri Company, owned by the Europeans, local leaders like Seljananda Sen could mobilize them again with relative ease in 1921 against their European landlords and the colonial state. However, once the movement turned militant, the Congress became lukewarm in its support, but by that time tribal agitation had acquired its own momentum. In the Gudem Hills of Andhra, another local leader, Aluri Sita Rama Raju, impressed by Gandhi, preached among the hillmen his message of temperance and khadi, but believed that India could be liberated only by force. Building on the existing tradition of Fituri, he started guerrilla warfare in January 1922, but unlike the earlier tradition, he wanted to take his battle beyond the tribal territory of the Gudem region. His attempt failed, as in May 1924 he was captured and executed. But this failed attempt showed, despite Congress' antipathy towards such violent upsurges, that tribal populations in India while maintaining their territorial anchorage were also developing a consciousness that connected them to a wider anti-colonial struggle. When the hillmen of Kumau raised slogans in praise of Gandhi and Swatantra Bharat, independent India, they exhibited a consciousness that was evidently broader than what we witnessed in the late 19th century. However, Congress itself had little to do with this consciousness or its political articulation. The Mahatma of his rustic protagonists, writes Sahid Amin, was not as he really was, but as they had thought him up. In their imagination the real Gandhi and his program of non-violent non-cooperation were often lost. They imagined Gandhi was endowed with extraordinary occult power. Peasants believed him to be a saint who could heal diseases, reward those who would follow him and punish non-believers who would dare to defy his authority. The rumours prevalent among the Tiavan Bialis of Bengal revealed their supreme faith in Gandhi's protective power. If they wore a Gandhi cap or chanted Gandhi's name, they believed police bullets would not harm them. This broke the barrier of fear and unleashed their energy into unprecedented mass activism. While chanting Gandhi's name, peasants participated in activities which easily crossed the threshold of Gandhian ideals. The tribal peasants of Bengal looted markets and fisheries and violated forest laws, prisoners broke the prison gates. In North Bihar, where the lower caste poor peasants were the most militant elements, messianic expectations led to a series of market looting incidents, 
a display of unheard of defiance of authority and bold interference with police action. So when the peasants of Gorakhpur attacked the local police station in Chori Chora and burnt alive 22 policemen, Gandhi had little option but to withdraw the movement, as it had definitely by then got out of his control. The local Congress leaders never did approve of these deviations from their authentic version of Gandhian movement, which was meant to dislodge the British without disturbing social harmony. But they had little control over the events. Gandhi was sympathetic to the masses and conceded that they often perceived things with their intuition, which we ourselves failed to see with our intellect. But he did not like their indiscipline and wanted to evolve discipline out of this habitual indiscipline. And when he failed, he condemned this mass exuberance as mobocracy. Therefore, even after the official withdrawal of the movement, it continued in pockets of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. In several villages in Kedah the Novenu campaign continued, while in UP another militant peasant movement developed in the form of Eka movement led by the tribal peasants, Pasi. Gandhi had used the Congress organization for launching what was no doubt the first nationwide mass agitation against colonial rule. It involved the peasants, some workers, Tiawan Bialis, and even in some areas the untouchables, but it is doubtful as to what extent they had accepted the Congress creed or internalized Gandhian ideology. Gandhi depended on a provincial leadership that consisted of such prominent personalities as young Jawaharlal Nehru in UP, C.R. Das in Bengal, Vallabhai Patel in Gujarat, Rajendra Prasad in Bihar, or C. Rajgopalachari in Madras. These provincial leaders again relied on the local leadership of men like Baba Ramchandra in Avad, B.N. Sasmal in Midnapur or Kumvarji Mehta in Bardoli. Through the structure of leadership Gandhi's message reached the masses, but then it was transformed and transfigured in their imagination as they imputed different meanings into the nationalist movement. The construction of these meanings, which depended on the specific structures of community, the local situations and the nature of existing organization determined the extent of mass militancy, which the leadership tried to control, but without success. In other words, the point that needs to be emphasized here is that what passed as a Gandhian mass movement actually contained within it various levels of consciousness informed by different visions of freedom. If the Congress tried to project through this movement a particular programmatic version of nationalism, it is also true that this version was continually contested from within the movement. And this was a feature that marked the subsequent Congress mass movements as well. If you like this video so please do like, share this video and hit the subscribe button.